Today's episode of the BS Podcast is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor and the only fan-friendly app for buying and selling tickets for sports and music with just two taps on your phone. You can instantly buy SeatGeek tickets to an event and have them delivered to your phone and enter the event. Technology, it's amazing. Drop your old ticket app, use the one that's built for 2016. Again, do everything on your phone. Download the free SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Simply Safe. Newsflash, burglaries skyrocket over the summer. And last time I checked, the summer is still going. Right now, Simply Safe has a phenomenal security package with entry sensors, motion sensors, and glass break. Right now, you can get $100 off my hand picked security package. Just go to simplysafebill.com to get this massive discount. We're also brought to you by the ringer.com, the Ringer Podcast Network. And my new HBO show, Any Given Wednesday, we have eight episodes in the book. We're taking a little break and coming back on September 7th. But you can catch up on all eight episodes on HBO On Demand, HBO Go, and HBO Now. And finally, we're selling merchandise for the, for the Ringer and to help raise money for our friends at CharityWater.org. The link is right on our website. It says merch, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, you name it. Shout out to Scott Harrison. Let's roll. Yeah. Yeah. Clear enough for you. All right. <laughs> Joe always yeah. likes. Yeah. Joe Puentes always yeah. likes when we play the music, the guest reactions. Uh, Jim Miller, aka James Andrew Miller, aka James Miller. You have multiple pseudonyms. Well, different code names for different parts of the world. I call you Jim. All right, there you go. Author of the ESPN book, The Oral History with Tom Shales. Author of the SNL book. Oral History with Tom Shales, two of my favorites, and now the author of Powerhouse. The book, An Oral History of CAA, which I'm surprised your car didn't blow up like halfway through. You must have feared for your life a couple times. No? No, but I, I think people told me that I should be uh, pretty secure with my internet and uh, you oh. know, computer stuff. Really? Like people thought it would, they were going to hack into the... Maybe not the current regime, but maybe people from previous Sarah's or I don't know, whatever. Really? It was one of those weird things where somebody mentions to you and just laugh about it. And then like two months later, somebody in a different part of the business mentions it to you. And then another person mentions it to you. And I just thought, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, with the ESPN book, Deadspin said, you know, by the way, we're going to, we'll, we're going to break into your, your place. We'll, we'll get the book <laughs> right. beforehand. I mean, which was kind of funny and cool and everything else. This was much more like, you know, dark shadowy. Ovitz is the star of the book. Mike Ovitz, legendary agent. I'm living in Boston in the 90s. I know nothing about anything with agents other than what I read in Spy Magazine because Spy Magazine used to go after CA a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew he was somewhat dangerous guy. And then the Late Shift movie came out about Letterman and Leno and Treat Williams plays Ovitz. And it's one of like the great only a couple minutes of the movie cameos anyone's done he comes in he's just perfect he lays it out for letterman and that's always been the ovitz in my head and then i read your book and now i i don't know what to think he's this super complex um borderline crazy person you know it's he's one of those people that um even for people who have traveled around the world and met lots of people you you do come away from spending time with michael ovitz thinking well i haven't met that before right I mean, he is, he, is a, he is a total outlier um, in part, and it comes back to the word you just used, which is, you know, complex. He, he has, he's very complex, and he has a, uh, a very unusual combination of qualities. Um, you know, the that most you don't power normally... hungry guy. You've done three books. Is he the most power hungry guy you've, of you've, the three books? you've covered? In I don't any even of those know who's three? second. Yeah. I, I mean, and it's not to say that, you know, like the pools of SNL and ESPN were, you know, filled with Amish people. Right. Uh, I mean, no, but there's, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's just like, he's in a different, you know, remember what, uh, McEnroe said about Borg. Yeah. Um, we're all playing tennis. He's doing something else. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. Well, on the one hand, he's a genius because you look at all the stuff that CAA did. I read your book in like three nights. I just, I love oral histories. This one I didn't know a lot of, like SNL and ESPN, it was, I'm reading those, almost wondering, I'm reading it going, I wonder if this is gonna be in, this I like knew nothing. But uh, some of the stuff CAA did, the packaging, you know, it was the first agency that thought, oh, we, uh, we have this star and this star and this director, we're just gonna get all three of them together and make a movie that way. The back end, 
can't we say that they kind of created that? We'll give up the salary, but you give us the points on the back end, and then all of a sudden people are making tons of money from these movies? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some studio executives like Tom Pollock, who's a genius deal maker, I think he was involved as well. But, you know, they, they did do those things. I mean, one of the great things that they did also was, I mean, it used to be like in William Morris in the 60s and early 70s, you called an agent and you said, and the studio said, you know, can so-and-so do a part? And then the agent would ask the actor or actress and they'd say no. And they'd call back the studio and say, you know, no, you know, she doesn't want to do it. Like, see, hey, you, everybody knew the information. So yeah. you're never going to call back with a no. You're going you're gonna to say who else in the agency can do it. So you're calling back and you're saying, no, Sylvester Stallone can't do this. But, you know, Michael Douglas can. Or, you know, what, I mean, just things that kind of say, make sense now. But they just weren't part of the equation back then. It seemed like... Before they showed up, it was very, very old school how these agencies worked. And then they just uprooted it, not just some of the deals they were making, but just how aggressive they were with poaching people. Were people always that aggressive with poaching before that, or did they kind of take well, it to another level? No, not as aggressive. And and that, for me, that was one of the through lines for SNL, ESPN, and CA. I mean, obviously, everyone knows the initials SNL and ESPN, but outside of Hollywood, maybe CA isn't. But there were so many through lines between all three, and one of them was, you know, Lauren Michaels with SNL, disruption. ESPN, you know, in the birth of cable sports, total disruption. CA, 1975 and beyond, disruption. Yeah. I mean, just like like literally blowing up the existing ecosystem that had been there. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. And it's probably why, like more than 40 years later, we're still talking about, you know, these, com these places. Because they really, they were so disruptive and they were so powerful that they had long legs. But the, the thing that... You know, I, I I didn't know a lot about Ovitz. I thought I did, but I really didn't. He was so good at what he did. And it's like somebody had a quote in there. He just never be happy. It was like you reach a point and you look around and you're like, I've, I'm the most powerful person in Hollywood. That's what I wanted to get to. I've made incredible amounts of money and I'm just sitting here and I'm still not happy. I think one, one of the people who didn't like him probably said that about him. But he kind of lost his way. And there's a clear tipping point. I don't want to I don't want to ruin people's enjoyment of the book by stepping on it, but he had a chance to to take a job that was like a dream job and he just wanted more and he wanted more and he wanted more. And that's like clearly the tipping point when his career cratered. Everybody knows he ended up going to Disney and that was a disaster. But yeah. it's funny that somebody has a quote about he was his own worst agent. The best agent probably of that entire generation was a terrible agent for himself. Right. And I think, I mean, look, he flew too close to the sun and he, as, as much as he had an understanding of what his clients needed and things to do for them, he didn't have that sense about himself. And I think that, you know, he probably needed just like presidents and other people, uh, sometimes celebrities, you, you need somebody around that has that sixth sense about you that you don't have but he kind of had that person had ron meyer who was like put, kind of put on earth to be that person well, right i should say then that you sometimes have you just to listen, listen to, that to him person. yeah right. yeah yeah you he need just to have that him. listen person you know um those two you know i, I say at the beginning uh, ca would not have been what it was if there were two ovitzes or two myers they like literally literally matched up so well um, like Lennon and McCarthy, like so many others, the combinations. Um, and it was, it was vital to the success of the place. The partnership thing. I, I remember I wrote a whole column. I'd read Eisner's book in 2010 and it was right when LeBron joined Miami and I went to the first Miami game. And then I think I went to the second one too, when they're together and it was so awkward, LeBron and Wade trying to figure out how to play together. And I wrote a whole piece about partnerships with Eisner and Frank Wells. And he's pretty candid about like Frank Wells, we were perfect. Cause Eisner admits like I have a giant ego, I'm power hungry, all these things. But Wells wasn't like that. And we were, it was, there was some good cop, bad cop side to it. And it seemed like Ovitz had that with, with uh, Ron Meyer. And then it just, he, he, then he just wanted everything. Yeah. And you know, it was all the more Shakespearean when Ovitz doesn't take that universal job and Meyer is the one who takes it. That was unbelievable. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm getting together with both of those guys on September 7th. And uh, oh yeah, you're, what are you doing? You're doing like a, the three of us in conversation, quote unquote. And it's the first time they're going to be together in public in like 21 years. I didn't realize they had a real estate feud that that then kept the other kind of bad blood thing 
going. So do they talk? They don't talk. Um, they've recently talked, and they kind of both blame me for that. Um, they blame you well, for? Well, I mean, my whole what thing did you was. Do? Well, I just, I mean, as I got to know each of them over the period of the last two and a half years, I just thought it was kind of uh, bizarre that in a small town like Hollywood, if you walk into a restaurant, it's like uncomfortable to see somebody that you worked with for 30 years. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to start singing Kumbaya and be best friends, but, you know, get over it at least to the point where, you know, you can have some sort of modicum of you know, civility and relationship with them. And Are so you that. talking about me and ESPN or Ovitz and Ron Meyer? I, I think that uh, <laughs> we need to take you and Skipper and put that on the... Uh... <laughs> but Ron Meyer ended up... He's also had this second life. Not only did he run Universal, but then his daughter married Tobey Maguire, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that his daughter? Uh-huh. And now he's... I, I don't know. He's, he's almost had a more interesting... It's not almost. He's had a more interesting second chapter whereas Ovitz just cratered well so it's, I don't what is the sports equivalent to what happened to Ovitz like I, Tiger I mean, Woods probably because I mean look Meyer is on a sixth owner as chairman of Universal who survives six owners I, I mean like Switzerland couldn't do that yeah, I, that's I mean, unbelievable it, that's that's crazy right and he's now been at Universal longer than he had been at CA but but as I mean your book over and over again and I know you're probably trying to play it as neutral as you possibly can when you're reporting something like that. And you come away from the book reading like, wow, Ron Meyer seems like a great guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the one of the first indications of that was like, literally, I think I had like 20 people say when I was interviewing them, by the way, you know, uh, Ron Meyer is my best friend. Ron Meyer and I are best friends. And I, you go to another interview, you know, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm Ron's best friend. And then all of a sudden you think, wait a second. It's like, what the heck is going on here? How does like, somebody have this many best friends? And it's not like we're friends or we're buds. Like everybody used, the operative word was best. Yeah. I mean, that's just that, pulling that off is kind of crazy. Wait, so you presented that side of the picture, but then there was this also this other Ron Meyer side where he's military and he's like, oh, but he'll rip your throat out in a second if you... If you're in a bar, you want Ron Meyer at your side. He'll fight the whole bar and he'll win. Oh, Michael Douglas told me this great story, and Joel Silver backed it up. They were there too. You know, they're they're in the the islands, and you know they're at some casino, and all of a sudden they looked over, and you know Ron Meyer's like literally jumping across the crap uh, the craps table to beat the crap out of two guys, including like <laughs> one guy who was really big and a guy that was Ron's size. And Ron talked about the story and said, well, the key is going after the really big guy first. Because right. you got you to take him out, you know, so then the smaller guy, he really can't hurt you. Except that he wound up, like, having his ribs broken in that fight. Right. But he's like, you know, so uh, which is it? Is it like he's the nice Jewish guy who talked to his mom every day when she was alive and everybody loves him? Or is it the guy, P.S., he's in the Marines and, you know, his body's covered in tattoos and he's probably the last guy that you want to piss off because, you know, he plays for keeps. I right. mean, that's like a duality that you don't see all the time i like that he had some quote in there like hey i you know i really miss fighting i, I loved a good fight it's like who who misses fighting like right, nobody like, he's I, like a kajillionaire like you know i haven't done it in a while i haven't been in, like i haven't been in a big fight in a while no I, you know that was that was <laughs> like, oh. it's like floyd mayweather i, I, mean, I haven't laced him up in a while totally fearless i mean look he he did get into and he talked about it very openly um there was a period of time where he, he owed some uh big gambling deaths yeah I mean, this is like like a you know a movie like you know you need like frank sinatra like big gambling for, deaths like yeah we're talking yeah. like eight figures and uh he actually went by himself to meet the guys to tell them that he didn't have the money for them i, I mean that's you know um that's not something that a lot of people you know would do um he wound up paying them off but i mean it's kind of like i mean i hate to use the word legendary but it's these stories, I mean, as I kept on hearing them, I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, is there like some screenwriter behind the scenes here who was like yeah. coming up with this stuff? But it was all true. Oh, and by the way, Ali McGraw. I mean, yeah, I never you know, knew that part. Ron uh, Meyer, did he, can we say he dumped his wife for Ali McGraw? Like he seemed no, like, I think, no, or they were breaking up and he yeah, found Ali McGraw. But, but I mean, but Ali McGraw, I mean, yeah. now people nowadays may not understand what that means, but no, they understand like, if they saw the Bob Evans documentary. The Bob Evans documentary. She was the best piece of ass I ever had. Right. Ellen McGraw, yeah, that I mean, whole like, or just about look at Goodbye Columbus for yeah. a nanosecond. Yeah. So, I mean, he goes to the top of the food chain, even in the, uh, you know, female department. Well, it seems like he had he didn't have a lot of trouble in that area. Ovitz, though, I've, 
th this might just be me overthinking it, but I felt like you held back a little bit. I, you, there are probably what five Ovid stories you could have printed. Did it, I mean? Didn't everyone? Well, I do have three children, right? You know, I'm, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, look, you know, um, I think that there are. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out where you're going with that. You, you know, no, but I mean, like, you can connect in the dots. Uh, I, I, like Ovid's, by all accounts, did horrible things, and you portrayed that, but you could have gone a little further. I'm guessing you well, had there, more ammo against them. Well, there's also, um, you know, we live in. There is a legal process yes. going on. That's, uh, I'm, you know, that's part why of, I like brought you know, this up. The, the vetting of the book and all that stuff, and uh, I also feel like, you know, these books. I mean, look at ESPN um, when I did those guys of all the fun. It, it, there was a lot left on the editing room floor. You don't. I mean, it's not about character assassination or hitting, like, diminishing marginal returns in terms of, like, pounding somebody. That isn't really instructive. I don't even mean a character assassination. It's just, you know, because you tell a couple stories about here's all the bad stuff this guy would do where he'd threaten people. You're never going to work in this town again. I will, I will ruin your agency tomorrow, all this stuff. But this is how he operated for, what, six, seven straight years? Once he reached a certain amount of power, he just used that power to threaten everybody every day, day after day. Longer And than that's that. why everybody hated him. And that's why he was could never get another job. I mean, you know, at the same time, he was doing, uh, he was transforming the business and doing an incredible job for his, you know, clients. So it, again, it's not just one dimensional. It's not, right. you know, there's just not one narrative where he's just all of a sudden going on this mad streak of insanity. He was also doing things that had never been done before and making deals with Japanese and, you know, trying to buy an NFL franchise. Yeah. He was, he was it. like what, 20 years ahead of Stan Kroenke with his LA idea. Mm -hmm. I, that was one of the revelations. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. And I actually he saw uh, that whole 25 years ahead. What was that? Like 1990? Yep. He's and basically going to build his own version of LA live. Uh, bigger than bigger than it is now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I interviewed Roger Goodell and uh, I saw that and uh, <laughs> your pal. And um, we uh, had went pretty deep about what Ovitz was like. <laughs> Lo and behold, Roger was like the uh, the person that Ovitz was working with on that because that's what his area of responsibility was back then. Well, the people who are wired that way, they all kind of stick up for each other. Because Goodell was like flattering to him. It's like, oh, you know, the guy's a visionary. <laughs> he'll get, he'll do what it takes to get a deal done. Well, I think you know that yeah. that was clear. Except he couldn't pull it off. He he. At the end of the day, he just didn't have enough money. Do you think that Ovitz? Did you get a feeling that he regrets his behavior now? Because I think he's the go-to story that everybody has about somebody that became super powerful in Hollywood and just took it too far. I I no. I don't. I didn't get that feeling at all. Really? No, uh, not at all. In fact, I think he, um, I think that when Michael Ovitz talks about 75 to 95, he's, uh, you know, he's incredibly proud uh, of what they built. Um, I also think he's incredibly proud, proud of what he did for others. Look, there's a ton of people who worked at CA from 75 to 95 yeah. who made a lot of money and had a lot of influence and, um, you know, may not have enjoyed that afterward. I, I mean, he... You know, he lifted a lot of boats, so I think he that's a big thing that he, he recognizes and talks about. Um, and I think that, you know, he he's very uh, he seems like a guy who on one level is very proud of, of what he accomplished and then probably frustrated and pissed off about some of the things that happened afterwards. Yeah. But, you know, has has explanations for it and uh, people to blame for it and uh well know. what's weird is how magnanimous he was with how they left caa to you call them the young turks the five younger up-and-coming guys I, I mean you mentioned letterman i mean michael Owens put that together and letterman went on to you know be on the air for another you know 20 plus One years great deals ever made in tv dave was making like with 32 million a year or sometime like, well Owens came up with the penalty the hundred hundred million dollars if he's not on eleven thirty, which is one of the smartest single tv moves ever and they created the opening for letterman's career but my only point is uh, that thirty-two million dollars, Ovitz wasn't getting ten percent of that. I mean, yeah. Michael Crichton was a close client of his. I mean, Jurassic Park. So Jurassic World opened last year. You know, one of the biggest openings that year. Ovitz, Meyer, and Haber, they didn't get a penny of that. I mean, that was the the deal that those five guys were able to engineer on uh, taking. You know, buying the company from the was one of the worst deals that Ovitz, you know, ever made. 
The Seinfeld one was probably even worse. Oh yeah, that's a Ron Meyer deal. So that's, that was, I mean, he obviously made that, but I couldn't believe Seinfeld. I mean, uh, CAA somehow doesn't get recurring commissions on the four billion and counting that Seinfeld has made. Four hundred million dollars, basically, you know, over, and counting. Right, and counting. Streaming is that? I mean, that's going to keep but going you know up and I, going I'll, up. I'll, uh, Ron Meyer was the one who, who you know, basically took CA out of it because. Howard West and George Shapiro, Jerry's managers, wouldn't have been able to be part of the show. Right. And they asked him as a favor. And, you know, Howard West had been, but first of all, remember, it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles back then. It was just a, a pilot who knew. But I think Ron, to this point, like, even given the success of Seinfeld, doesn't regret it because he did a solid for, you know, his buddies, uh, you know, George and Howard. Well, they made. 500 other deals that were awesome so that you're going to have a few that you miss on i couldn't believe right. what i didn't realize as i was reading the book was how involved ca was in basically every single movie and tv show that i liked for for like a 17 year span it's like you just kept oh and tom hanks and michael douglas and it was like well i like every michael douglas movie and oh all these tv shows and it just it never ended i mean you look at their client list and it was unparalleled i mean yeah. they represented basically everybody, almost everybody who was important. And, uh, you know, that was part of the reason why I wanted to do the book because not a lot of people know the, you know, like I was saying, the initials, but CA intersects with your, your past life in terms of what you used to watch and what you love. And nowadays, I mean, you know, whether it's J.J. Water, you know, uh, Game of Thrones or... The decision. Any, I, the, de the decision. Uh, <laughs> listen, when you go into a Chipotle, CA is involved. They do the yeah. marketing. I mean, so it's like... Wait a second. We don't know a lot about them, but they're with you every single day. Yeah. Well, uh, th don't you feel like, um, well, first of all, I got to mention, I mean, I know Ari a little bit, so it's not, not totally from, I'm a tiny bit biased, but his quotes were fantastic. I think he was, Ovitz is the MVP of the book, but Ari is like best supporting actor because every time he comes in, it's just fire and he's just taking shots left and right at, uh, at CAA and he was, he was, there's this one part near the end when he's so happy that CAA's new mission was, we're going to try to represent everybody. It's like, this is great. They've turned from Tiffany's to Sears. Yeah. This is the best thing that ever happened to our business, but he's, he does not hold back in the book. No, I, I think that's one of the, the things that people really like about him. He's, yeah. he's totally transparent. He's unvarnished. He's not, I mean, he's co-chair of this incredibly big company now, right? I mean, they just laid out $4 billion for the UFC. I mean, he's the co-chair of it. And yet he's not like walking around with this like manicured talking points. No. I mean, he shoots in the hip and, you know, there's a great story he tells in the book about when he was at CA and he wanted to leave, you know, he threatened to throw a chair at Ovitz. I mean, and he's like, I couldn't believe you that. know, I mean, he's totally fearless. And I think that, you know, it's the interesting thing is it's the exact opposite of the way the CA guys are. You know, they don't really, they don't speak in sound bites. They don't want a high profile. They don't have those kind of personalities. Yeah. So you have like two diametrically opposed um, styles of leadership. You know, in Hollywood right now. Ari has a treadmill desk. Does that make you think more or less of him? No, I, I mean I think it it totally fits. First of all, I mean the guy works. You know every single minute every single Hilarious. day so he's, he's in his in the suit with his jacket off put sneakers on and just does phone calls and i, I don't know how he does it no but i don't I know mean, if he sleeps he's got it i don't i don't think so um you know but my only point is he's got to somehow stay in shape so that makes perfect sense he, he's not going to take an hour away from the phone and no. you know and to work out i mean no way also the best phone call person i've ever been involved with Gets to the point, no small talk, it's over. It's it's almost like how the filet mignon is the best steak cut. Right. Ari's phone calls are just like, what are the three things we're gonna hit? And I'm out. But it's a it's a sign. And you use the next one. I mean, like, okay, great. But it's a sign. I mean, Doug Ellen, who created, you know, Entourage, tells a great story in the book about it was originally gonna be, you know, modeled after somebody, and then he was in a meeting with Ari. And it's like, oh, wait a second, forget it. We're changing the whole we're changing the whole thing here. I got my guy. Well, he modeled it. And the original art was modeled after Jeff Jacobs, which I do not think that would have worked. That would have uh, been a weird choice. Well, it certainly wouldn't it have needed to be been... an HBO show. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, that could have been broadcast. No offense against Jeff Jacobs, but you know, that's, that could be an NBC. Yeah. Show. He's not Jeff Jacobs. Isn't dropping F bombs and doing I mean, crazy. The moment shit. you go from Jeff yeah. to Ari, then you're talking cable.
Let's take a quick break to talk about Sonos, the smart speaker system that streams all your favorite music to any room or every room. Control your music with one simple app and fill your home with pure immersive sound. It brings you all your music in one simple app. And it's the same app that brings together all your favorite music services and lets you control everything from songs to volume to even what's going on in every room. All of them at once. Play a different song in the living room, bedroom, bathroom. Play the same track in every room. Do whatever you want. Add your existing music services or discover something new. Try Sonos. We have it in the Simmons house. It's great. I recommend it. And another thing I recommend, uh, stop wasting money on expensive takeout. It's stupid. Just sign up with Blue Apron. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron will deliver you all the fresh ingredients you need for a delicious and healthy home-cooked meal. They have the highest standards for ingredients. They build a community of home chefs that has no rival. We also eat this in the Simmons house. They were kind enough to send it to us. My son calls it Blue Apron, which we make fun of him for, um, and asks my wife every once in a while, I want some Blue Apron. It's Blue Apron. Uh, some of the meals available in August, spiced pork burgers with goat cheese and cucumber corn salad, summer vegetables and quinoa bowl, chicken tinga tacos with summer squash and tomato salsa. Speaking of tacos, check out uh, House Eat 6, which we put on Facebook Live uh, on the Ringer's Facebook page. Danny Chow defeated Joe House for the, uh, for the Ringer Eating Championship. Um, Blue Apron, you don't have to overeat because it's so delicious. Right now, you can get your first three meals for free with free shipping. Go to blueapron.com slash BS. Recommended by my son, blueapron.com slash BS. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And now, back to Jim Miller. So what's been the reaction to the book in, in Hollywood and stuff? Because it's been out for a few days, and I know it had to be... I mean, it was like top secret. You There weren't copies getting out of it and the whole thing, like... What, what were they worried about? What were they worried was going to get out? Um, or is just trying to build suspense toward the book? No, 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 no. I mean, the books are embargoed. I mean, the ESPN book was embargoed, and I think ESPN was concerned for, you know, uh, a time there. I, I think that you don't know what's going to be in the book. So I think if I'm CA, you know, you're kind of curious. And uh, I think people um, were, there was you know, some pent up demand and it's been great because a lot of people did go out and get it. And have, you know, I mean, it's not an easy quick read and yet no. um, I'm kind of blown away by how many people have already finished it. I mean, they're like literally texting or calling or tweeting about things that are, you know, in different parts of the book. So it's not like they just read one section and liked it. So oral know. histories like M&Ms, you just can kind of keep going. At some point, you just have to have the willpower to stop. Or you can open it up at any place, too. That's the thing. You can uh, you can stop, come out. Come, I mean, they're I mean, just there was so one easy to read. reviewer who, like, kind of decided to take on the oral history format. And, uh, Why? I mean, you can talk to Studs Terkel or, you know, George. What's I mean, wrong I don't with the know, oral history like, format? It's a great format. But it's like going into a Japanese restaurant and wanting matzo ball soup. I mean, yeah. this is what it is, man. I mean, yeah. you know, if you don't like it, then that's fine. But I personally think, I mean, this... Definitely was the case with SNL and ESPN, and I think it's the same case here. You can't replicate the way these people talk. I mean, you know, when you, when for Bill Murray in the SNL book or Will Ferrell or Tina Fey, I mean, that's oral history is so transparent and it's so palpable, and you get to see these people in a way that you just can't. I mean, Chris Berman, you know, it starts off by saying, you know, I was born on John Wilkes' birthday. I and mean, who can, if you're, you're, Hemingway couldn't come up with that. I was like, what? I, I, wait, can we go back? You know, I mean, they're just, every sentence reveals who they are. And, uh, you know, so I just, I love the form. Bill Murray's secret uh, best supporting actor nominee for this book. I didn't expect so many good Bill Murray anecdotes and jokes he is and 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 texting me saying How hey man you if, if you want to um several times i mean you know, but then you like to get a text from bill saying hey man i just thought of something else if you if you if you're interested i don't oh, know let me think am i interested in talking to bill murray again who says he's got a really cool story no nah, nah, i'm too busy yeah, I'm good, bill. i don't I need mean, any more info no i mean it's just just I fantastic sylvester stallone oh he was incredible i i mean come on you forget how it, it reminded me i mean I didn't need to be reminded because he's probably one of my three favorite actors of all time. But to to have a point when you hit a point as an A-lister where they just save you a slot for the next summer, which I never knew they did with him. And they were like, all right, so 
July 1986 Sly movie. We don't have a script yet, but we know we're going to make one. And Sly gets his pick of projects, and he'll tell us what he's going to make, and then it'll come out. And it's like planes over Nobody our Nobody has that now. No. Not I mean, one person. Fat, the Fast and Furious franchise might have that. That's it. Uh, I, I mean, it was amazing. And, you know, Ron Meyer talked about, you know, they used that to block off streets for like blocks when they would be coming out of a restaurant. But then also they were over in uh, for a Rambo First Blood. It's like yeah. the Far East, like Thailand or some jungle. It's like in the jungle in Thailand. Yeah. And it's like everybody's yelling Rocky. I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's not quite at least status, but Sylvester Stallone, I mean, he was a huge blip on the radar and people forget about it. I do think we, when I interviewed Caitlyn Jenner for my show, I asked her something that she did not answer. We didn't put it in the show. It was on like the deleted scenes, but I asked her who was more famous, her in 1976 or Kim and Kanye now. And she was like, Oh, that's a great question. But then she was like, it was clearly the answer is me. Like the, the Olympics had a 70 share, right? You know, we had, three three network channels and like four extra channels everybody had like seven channels it was like you watch the olympics and it was like if you didn't know who bruce jenner was in 1976 you were like in a log cabin somewhere and he and bruce jenner did it without snapchat and twitter yeah, all, that stuff. all the other engines that the kardashians Massive have fired fame on. and then sly was kind of at the tail end of that before things started as splinter but like sly in the 80s and arnold in the 80s i don't think there's there's actors that are famous like that now no, and he, but but my only point is like he he said, you know, when uh, we talked about when Ron called him up to say he was going to be leaving as an agent and taking this job at Universal. Yeah, I mean, like Stallone goes into this like almost poetic uh, discourse about them crying. Oh, and, he's devastated. And he, wrote, he wrote Ron a poem with uh, about mountains, about mountains <laughs> when two mountains see each other. Like who? Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I put that in a script and the studio would say, yeah, it was, it's a good scene, but you know, this idea of like Sylvester Stallone writing poems to another guy, let's uh, cut that out. I don't think that's going to fly with the audience. And it was like un unbelievable. Well, you know, I love all the Hollywood stuff. I mean, there, there are so many small tidbits that I love, but like one of them was about how they kind of didn't know what to do with Redford for the stretch in the eighties, which is crazy when you think about it, because this was one of the five biggest actors of my lifetime. But he hit this point where he was a little too old to be like in a rom-com and or be like in some of those Tom Cruise roles, the underdog who turns it around. Right. But he wasn't quite old enough to be the older role. So it's like, what do you do with them? And they end up uh, doing like that Legal Eagles CA package, which was a terrible movie. No, but how about the deal on Indecent Proposal? Well, that but that's what I never realized that led to Indecent Proposal. And it was like, and I had even forgotten that movie happened, but it was a huge movie. And, and it was a big deal that he was in it. But they but they got him in because of the budget in the movie. They basically said, okay, you know, here's a little bit up front, and, but you Take have some a on big the back. back end. And, uh, you know, you wind up north of $30 million on that movie. And that's like, that's, that's a couple. He was like five scenes. And, and that's, that's back when $30 million was really like $30 million. And they got, didn't they get Hanks right when his career, his, he was frustrated with his old agency because they kept giving him the same parts. Yeah the same ideas for the same parts and sequels to parts he's done. And he, he flips over and then catch Hanks for the great, they caught Hanks and Douglas for the two, one of the two of the best runs of all time. But they had so many, I mean, in the, in the late eighties and early nineties, CA had so many gross participants for clients. I mean, that's real money. First dollar gross and back ends. I mean, that's unbelievable. Because almost like the studios didn't totally know what they were doing. Now they've limited some of that stuff, right? Well, yeah. There's I mean, more it's, checks it's, and balances. Yeah, and it's, I mean, there's fewer fewer studios, fewer movies being made. It's a, you know, buyer's market, not a seller's market. I mean, there's a lot of, look, uh, Ovitz and Meyer were lucky that they were in the movie business back then. Um, because they had much more influence and many more clients working. Uh, it's, it's a tougher business now. You know, you mentioned near the end, you talk about how they got into CAA sports, which became a big thing, but they also got into the sports media side too. Not nearly the kind of money maybe you make from Tom Hanks and Sly Stallone and all those people, but that turned into a really good side business for well, no. what their business was, right? No, actually the, the surprise for me and, um, it was really cool to kind of report this, for, uh, was that in 2015, CA Sports made more money for the first time in CA history than movies or television. Was that in the book? Yeah. 
Oh, see, that's the first time I've slipped. You could tell I read every page of the book. No, it's a big book. I must book. have been trying to get to the end at that point. It's a big, a big book. CAA Sports made more than CAA Movies? For first time, more revenue. Wow. Yeah. So that sports media advisory business, which Skipper has a quote in the book where he's like, That was a good quote. I don't really get that, you know? And uh, You need a third party to advise you how much to spend. Right. Or, to, make, or to how much money you should command. Or to make me spend more is right. the subtext of that. Yeah. Right? Um, but... I mean, that, yeah, CA Sports is now king of the hill. So you, but in general, it's very splintered right now. I, I don't think, do you feel like there's an alpha dog with agencies? It seems I think, like they, they all bring different things to the table. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, if you're just going to go on terms of like size and, uh, you know, and breadth, then CA is, you know, obviously right up there. And WME, it's the two of them because of, of, of sheer size. I mean, CA believes in its dominance. They think that they are, you know, dominant in every sector and, you know, WME, IMG should, you know, only hope to be what they are. And meanwhile, WME, IMG is, seems pretty happy with what they're doing. I mean, they're both backed by private equity. Yeah. So, you know, these agencies are not self-owned now for the first time. Um, I would say WME, IMG looks like they're more determined to be building toward a massive public opening would be my guess uh look they they've been on i mean just i'm just kind of adding UFC giant alone. assets yeah big big i mean you know over eight billion dollars and just those two acquisitions and that's crazy um so i i i definitely think you know those private equity firms um particularly wme may they may wind up going public uh sooner rather than later didn't you think it was interesting that a recurring theme in the book was how agents eventually get tired of being agents that they hit a point where they're just like, there's got to be more in life than just me getting a commission and having to constantly babysit people and worry about them. And, and they just all burned out on it over and over again. It was the same kind of sentence. Well, it's for a reason, right? I mean, yeah. like if I, if I like literally took 25 year old bill and said to you, I'm going to park you in an office and you're going to like literally work harder than you've ever worked before. And you're going to have to be totally responsive to all these people who are going to be calling seven you seven days a week, seven days a week. There's no such thing as off time. And, uh, you're going to have to uh, be in a very, 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 very competitive world. And PS at the end of the day, these clients, they owe you nothing. And they might leave. That's they, another recurring I mean, theme. Evil at Longoria, any second, they might leave. Eva Longoria, I interviewed her maybe five, six months ago, and she's in the book talking about how great, you know, CA was and all the things that, and you know, she left last month. Oh, seriously? She left. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, so you, you just- have to change that for the paperback. Uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> no, I want to go back and interview her now for the paperback and say, you know, why'd you leave? What happened? But I mean, there's, there's you know, uh, there's no guarantees. And so, I mean, just think about all the agents in town who work at smaller agents who have, you know, agencies and have worked with these student directors who have like, you know, tried and tried and tried to get a movie made. And then they finally get a movie made and it's a really successful movie. And all of a sudden the next thing that's happening is they're calling up saying, hey, I'm sorry, man. Like, thanks for the last six years sticking with me. I'm signing with uh, CA now. Uh. And, and it's like, and you're sitting there at that other agency and you're just, you're just toast. I mean, and well, that and unlike your... sports agents and some other agents, they can't just lock somebody up to the long-term deal where they know they're going to get the commission all the time. If it's movie by movie. Well, and... that was the cool thing about the LeBron quote too, which was, you know, when he left CA, I mean, you know, I mean, they had done, they had tried to be really good to him, but you know, once Rich Paul was going out, that was it. Goodbye. You know, I've still never, I always felt like there was more meat on that bone. Everybody's kind of still quiet about that whole thing for the most part. You got you got more than I've seen anyone get, but well, I don't there's know. A that, lot more. I, I, that whole I will, group was pretty tight. Here's I will say this about the oral history format: um, you you do reach a point where people are willing to say something, and then they're going to go on background. And I try and use some of that background with the interstitials, and so I did talk about you know, World Wide West and some of the other yeah, yeah, yeah. aspects of that. But um, truth is, I could probably write 50 pages on it if it wasn't the oral history format. Are a you offering to do this for The Ringer? A lot of people were very uh, <laughs> open with me about um, things. And, uh, you but know, I mean, that a was a very story. tight knit group. You know, Leanne was a big part of that whole thing. So was Wes. And... I don't know. In general, I, I kind of feel like it's been glossed over as a major sports story where you have 
LeBron as a vested interest in this agency that not only is he a client of, but other players, people that he plays with, people on other teams. I've never, does he get, does he get like, if the equity of the company comes up, that's good for him. I, I've never told, I don't, it, it's kind of the story Adam Silver doesn't ever want anyone to talk about. Well, that's one of the reasons it's a why. It's conflict I, of interest. I wanted to, uh, you know, at least get it, get into it in the book, at least, yeah. you know, the seeds of it, because I felt like it, it hadn't been talked about a lot, but, um, there's a lot of, so, lot of repercussions to that story. A lot and, of need on that bone. And, and when you think about the fact that CA, the, you know, just right before it, had Wade, Bosch, and LeBron, so they're in the room, right? And they got three. I mean, Pat well, Riley Henry Thomas to me about had it. two of them, and Leon had LeBron. Right, but yeah. it was all coordinated. It was beautifully choreogra uh, choreographed years before. Leon Rose, I mean. Like really smart chess oh, player. Yeah. Like I mean, you you kind of well, oh that's gonna happen in two years. So you do a two year deal. You don't do a three year deal. And I mean, Carmelo was the one who kind of like didn't play by the timetable. He had to, the other agent, right? Yeah. To 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 max the leverage. They told him though, no seven to do three year out. And I think that other agent was worried. May you know he's trying to lock Carmelo up from as many years as possible, probably for the commission, but. Carmelo stays the extra year, doesn't time it right. But I mean, the repercussions. It's one of the great that, what ifs. Uh, I mean, unbelievable. Because if those four decided, screw it, let's all play in the same team, we'll all take discounts. Like, holy shit, now the whole decade of the NBA is different. But Absolutely. in general, the LeBron thing's fishy to me. Uh, maybe fishy is the wrong word. It's something. He's a well, stakeholder in a company that represents other NBA players that he plays with and competes against. It seems strange. Yeah. I mean, the good news is at least ESPN got the decision out of it. That's so true. they had that going for them, which is nice. Do you think the decision was uh, a success or a failure in retrospect? It certainly raised LeBron's profile. I think it raised his profile and the fact that he went, I mean, obviously the fact that he went there was... That was huge. It was, was, was huge. It got a huge rating for ESPN. Yep. It got a huge rating for ESPN. And I think the next day... Everybody at ESPN was firing shots at each other. Just be, it was one of those unique moments, it. by the way. In I Bristol was so glad culture, I wasn't involved. In Bristol culture, where I mean, usually you know there are certain, as you know, certain covenants yeah. to life in Bristol. Yeah. And one of them is don't shoot your own troops. And the next day, it was like Warren Zevon time. Send Laurie's guns and money because everybody was was really firing away at each other. That was that was one of the bloodiest aftermaths. Of the last, you know, decade, it's it, well. I think ESPN. The, the big regret was having Jim Gray in there, who wasn't technically really an ESPN person. Like, I, I think, what was that part of it that it was like, well, if we're going to do this, don't why isn't one of our own people the person that, to do the that interview? That was that was that was a huge part of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that you know, uh, for Skipper and John Wildhack, who's part of it, like you know, it was a Faustian bargain, which is okay. It's coming as a package deal, so you know, we we got to do it. Did uh -huh. I ever tell you, I swear to God, this happened. I swear on my kids. Um, a reader had a mailbag question joking that LeBron should do the decision. Like it was the going into that last season that LeBron should do after the year, do it like his free agency, like it's the bachelor and just vote people off every week. And I thought it was a really good idea. And when we were at all-star weekend in 2011, which I think was Dallas, me and Skipper and Connor met with Maverick and we talked about the idea and then it just kind of, I don't know what happened. It's, it was just out there. And then we assumed we were going to fall. We all thought he was going to make the finals. Remember it was two thousand. Oh, so it was 2010. 10, right. Um, so that, that's, I think the all-star game was, maybe it wasn't Dallas, wherever the NBA all-star game was that year. Um, but, um, so we go. And we're like, well, after the playoffs, LeBron's going to make the finals. And he, but when he lost to Boston, it was like, well, that he'll never do that idea. And I ne never even pursued it, thought about it, anything. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it was like, Jim Gray had this great idea. And I was like, I mean, maybe he came up with it independently. I mean, he probably did. But I was always amazed that that idea happened when not only was it in my mailbag, but we actually met with Maverick. Wow. I never told you that story. No. But, you know, I guess those were those days when you and Skipper and Connor were you know, joined the hip and singing Kumbaya and able to, you know, pitch things times. together. A lot of, lot of hotel bar drinks. You know, I was thinking. You did have your, you did have, look, one of the things that I constantly remind people, you did have your golden era there. I mean, people have short memories. Golden, people have short memories? Who said I didn't have a golden era? No, I think they have a tendency to focus on, you know, the departure because, you know, but I, I think there were some 
Some had a great run. It was awesome. Run. We had a really fun time. On on all levels, though, I mean. Yeah. I mean, I, even summer of 2013, I remember really, really uh, pitching Nate Silver to come and, ta- and really pitching him on, like, what a creative place this had become and how cool it was to work there. That was summer of 2013. The big thing for me, I think Skipper is the best content executive the company's ever had. I mean, you, you look at all the stuff that he did. It's amazing. Like he going back to the website, the magazine, 30 for 30, um, just on and on and on. Grantland, all the stuff that he's done that he had his hands in, the, the foresight to back soccer. You know, was there, is there an ESPN executive who did more, made more smart moves and less failures? You know, he got them away from uh, all those stupid TV movies they were doing and st- stupid shit like Bonds on Bonds kind of veered them away from that into stuff that was a little more quality. And then I mean, when I think he the got, problem was Skipper needed a skipper once he became well, president. Well, that's the thing. He got promoted and he vacated that job and he was doing a completely different job. And that's when the company changed for me. Yeah, I'm not so sure that he vacated that job as I think that he thought that because he liked it so much and he knew he was good at it, um, that I think that maybe he thought that he could still do it not necessarily to the degree that he did it before, but still have a big role in it because he didn't he replace he himself. Could delegate. Well, he I mean, that's he could the delegate. first indication, right? Yeah. I mean, so. Um, but think how crazy that is, though. Like if Belichick left the Patriots or if Belichick got, maybe Belichick becomes part owner of the Patriots or whatever, he wouldn't then turn over the Patriots to all the coordinators and been like, I'm not hiring a head coach. I'm still going to be involved, but you guys run it now. Because you know what happens. Now everybody's grabbing territory and turf, and and you need somebody at some point who's going to be a tastemaker. Right, but then look at it the other way. So let's just say you're John Skipper, and you get Bodenheim's, Bodenheimer's job. Like, do you really want to give up the stuff that you like the most? I mean, here, here that president job, I mean, you're dealing with, like, affiliate relations, and you got to be on the plane to Burbank all the time, and you're dealing with, It's a with, horrible like, job. I mean, you know... I uh, mean, the, the the power and the pay is great, but he was, he was on a plane all the time. Sub fees and everything else. Like, I mean, all that stuff that he did with you and all that stuff that he did in the content universe, I mean, you don't want to give it up because that's, like, that's your oxygen. I mean, you know, in some way. So, but the thing is, we, I mean, I could see it just because how much time he had to spend on different things. And it totally changed once he took the other job, you know, because he, he was one of those guys. He always knew what was going on. And he would be like, oh my God, I saw this piece on so and so. But, you know, he's flying to Burbank every week. Yeah. And he's flying to India to do the cricket world, the cricket world series, whatever that, what is it, the cricket? cup whatever then he's flying to austin and that becomes your job you're just flying to all these different locations i, I think though in all fairness uh, i think it was probably harder on you than 99.9 percent of the people at the company i think you felt the brunt of it and you recognized the disparity between skipper as president and skipper as head of content more because it, it like well, I literally cared about affected. the quality of the stuff we were doing though What's that? I, I mean, I cared about the overall quality of the stuff we did as a company. I mean, it was that, that was a big reason I was able to get stuff done. And I, I felt when that quality starts to slip, you right. know, I, I always felt the weird thing about me was I always felt like I really wanted to be on the best team. Like that was part of the appeal of being at ESPN is I wanted to be on the best team doing the best stuff, you know, and skipper was the best at that like he cared about being the best doing the best things quality like when you think about 30 for 30 that was a 15 million dollar commitment that they made to outsource 30 documentaries to filmmakers like no no media company has ever considered doing anything like that before it's a huge risk but you do it if you really care about what the upside is what do you think though came first which is you starting to recognize that you didn't have the access to him that you normally, that you used to have for so many years, or you starting to feel like that the quality that you wanted wasn't part of the experience anymore. And then attributing that to, I don't think it was an access thing. I, I just think things change. Like I think people have good runs. They have ebbs and flows, things like that. My issues were, were always with the people you know, on the lower, on the level below. And, you know, maybe being in LA wasn't a great thing either, but, um, in general, like, you know, I think one of the craziest things that happened, I remember in 2014, 
when all of a sudden they were heading toward doing ESPN 35, which... By the way, I, I think I've been told that you weren't even part of that presentation, right? No, I, I, we, I wasn't involved at all. It was a right. different part of the company. Yeah. And they came up with this idea to do, to celebrate ESPN's 30th, 35th anniversary with all these different documentaries and stuff. And we're sitting there, we're like, you know, about two thirds of the way through th the second series of 30 for 30 at that point. It was so stupid on so many, excuse me, on so many levels. And on top of it, they, you know, we saw the memo for it and the memo looked like our 30 for our 30 for 30 memo. Like there were similarities in it. And we were like, what the fuck is going on? Like, we're going to do ESPN 35, but also have 30 for 30, like our, our viewer. And that was like this big internal thing. I was trying to squash it. And I don't, I don't think that helped either. I, I don't think there's a company, um, that a media company right now in existence for the last decade or so where geography does play such a dramatic role. I think that, you know, people have a, a tendency to underestimate just what that biosphere in Bristol is like. And the fact that you were 3000 miles away, um, you know, I think it's, it's always going to be a dependent part of the very dependent variable, like not an independent variable is like, it was, it was always part of that equation that you, yeah. you know, of everything going back and forth between you guys. I, I mean, I look at it really positively that we did a lot of good stuff, you know, and we were able to kind of navigate some of that. And then I look at, you know, just how hard it is to do good stuff, especially in a big company. But I think a lot of what that Bristol culture is, is just protecting the infrastructure of stuff and you see what, how they do it with the studio shows, the people on the studio shows change all the time, right? The way they change them. Don't the people who are in charge of those studio shows never change. Like when you never see turnover with the executives who kept picking the people that they did decided didn't, didn't work. I mean, in my case I left, but, um, but it's, they do it the same way every time it's always centered around the host, heavily produced short sound bites everything's got to push toward the upcoming game and you know and then they're like well how do we get how do we get to do like a show like the barkley show it's like because the bar the tnt is doing something completely different with the barkley show it has no resemblance to anything you guys are doing well it's going to be interesting because obviously you know john waldeck who was you know under skipper and still looked over a lot of that stuff i mean he's gone now and I, connor we, we didn't and get Bert, along. what's that we didn't get along yeah i know, I know. <laughs> I know. And uh, <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see how much disruption there is at ESPN now that there's some different people kind of looking over it all. The same people that, yeah. The, I mean, a lot of these people should have gotten their chance sooner, I will say. But I think that's the thing. It's tougher when you have a giant company like that to kind of move. And that, that was a big frustration, you know. A couple of people that were really good, some left. Some almost left a couple times, but you that's, know, and that's the biggest problem about Bristol, which is you move your family out there, your kids start going to school in Connecticut, and it's not like in New York where you're gonna all of a sudden like take a job and you cross the street to a different network. I mean, you know, people like don't date Bristol, they marry it, and so like they're just like locked in, it's like a life sentence, and so right. all of a sudden you have like people like. You know, I noticed when I started talking to people, I, I've been here like 25 years. I've been here like 27 years. I've been here like, 20, and it's like, so there's so little movement. I mean, if you get a guy like Wild Hack in there, it comes right out of college, he's not leaving. So if you're somebody like Connor or Burke Magnet, like, you know, you'd be, you know, no matter what kind of job you, you know, you think you're doing at your, your job now and you deserve a promotion or whatever. I mean, there's- At some point you have to go. Yeah, I mean, it's- it's a huge competitive advantage for them. And I don't think it was intentional, but they would have all these people who lived in middle Connecticut where, you know, you got public schools, it's less expensive, but then, and I had some friends that this happened to where the MLB network or the NFL network starts pursuing them and what they're offering. Yeah. It's a raise, but when you, when you remove the cost of living and now I'm living in New York city or Los Angeles, you're actually taking a pay cut to do the job. I, it's and crazy. That, that's how, and I, I, again, I don't think it's intentional, but I think that's, it was just one of those it keeps look, it, people there. It was three of the secret good luck charms for Bristol for ESPN. One was keeping your people. Yep. The second was no unions. I mean, cause like their cost structure was totally different because of no I unions. I forgot about that. And the third is 
none of the big wigs are going to go to the middle of Connecticut. So even when like Cap Cities was like owning ESPN, like everybody like, well, how are they doing? Yeah, let's have a phone call. Like nobody, nobody's walking the halls telling, you know, anybody what to do there. And that kind of freedom, um, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. Let's take a quick break to talk about our old friends at MeUndies, one of the first sponsors of the BS Podcast. They sent me a big box of comfortable underwear in October, and I've been wearing it ever since. Sometimes they send me new underwear. Uh, every pair of MeUndies is made from sustainably sourced modal, a fabric that's twice as soft as cotton. Once you try them on, you'll understand why it has the reputation as the world's most comfortable underwear. They have dozens of styles, limited edition prints, boxers, trunks, thongs, bikinis, Shipping is free in the U.S. and Canada. You can save up to $8 per pair with the MeUndies subscription plan. So why wouldn't you? And if you don't like your first pair of MeUndies, they are free. Go to MeUndies.com slash BS for 20% off your first order plus free shipping. That's MeUndies.com slash BS. Back to Jim Miller. I'm, I'm actually more bullish on ESPN's future than I think the, the conventional wisdom now is that their subs are dropping. And I still think they have just a massive lead and you're talking about, Oh, they're going to lose money with it. It's like they made tons and tons and tons of money. And now they're just probably going to make less money than they made. They're still going to make tons of money. And it's still and they like, got a big moat. I mean, one of the things, huge that Skip, one of the things that Skipper did right from the beginning was he just loved the idea of live. He, he just, yep. I mean, the Rose Bowl, I, I, I don't even know if Game of Thrones is going to be on three years from now, but guess what? People are going to want to watch the Rose Bowl. I mean, he just, he made a commitment and he engineered these longer, longer deals with these conferences and they spent $27 billion on college football for like years and years and years. Live rates. $15.3 billion with the NFL. So, you know, you well, can't get- Well, to add to that point, like when he took, when he basically took over the content, the previous regime was trying to- add like an MTV element to everything they were doing. And it was like, sports is, sports might go away. We got to build our movies and our TV, things like this. I mean, uh, you know, our scripted TV, uh, reality, stuff like that. And then Skipper was kind of like, now nah, we'll, we'll show games. Yeah, our business I mean, is games at sports center and, yeah. and we can do this other stuff, but ultimately we make all our money with games. And, and by the way, th so the big 10 deal just closed, which they spent a fortune on. Yeah. The NBA deal closed, which they spent for it. There's nothing up for grabs now. It's not like the competitors. So Jamie Horowitz over at Fox, I mean, he's taking Skip Bayless and he's taking Jason Whitlock, but you can't take all of a sudden, you know, you can't take like um, a, a huge franchise like Monday Night Football away from them. They've right. got those properties lined up. So I think that gives them a huge advantage in the, in the years to come. Fox's mistake was they declared war on ESPN. And I was there. I mean, it was laughable. Like the Fox thought they had a chance to beat ESPN with FS1. They did have a chance to go after ESPN too. And I think if they had messaged that coming out of the gate, that look, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We want to be here for 40 years. Maybe someday we can, right. we can battle ESPN. But right now we think we can battle ESPN too. We think we can get there pretty quick. We have all these live rights that are better than the ESPN2 live rights. And we can do opinion programming and veer away from, like, I think they have a chance to beat ESPN2 or at least compete with it pretty seriously in the next three, four years. But ESPN1, no way, never a chance. Right. I mean, why go toe to toe with like a $45 billion? I mean, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. You don't have to do that. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, look, Jamie spent some serious dollars on, uh, on talent. Yeah. And I think, you know, he saved money too. He canceled some programs. So he, I don't think that's he did some reallocating. Enough. You yeah. know, he did re reallocating, but it'll be very interesting to see, um, what the success is with some of these people like skip. And I mean, ESPN wanted to keep Skip Bayless, make no mistake about it. And, you know, he wanted to go to Fox. Uh, you know, Jason and Colin and others, um, you know, Jamie's been very aggressive. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. I think, uh, you know, I think about it sometimes because uh, Jamie's my friend. I want him to do well. You go to an airport, you go to a bar, you go to even like the commissary we have on our lot here. And there's always like one or two or three channels on. And ESPN's always one of the channels. I don't know how you beat that. It's not just like, oh, we can have better programming or this week we have the World Series and you don't. It's just this fundamental way that ESPN became part of people's lives. It's just there. 
but I, to push people off those office channel office and bar TVs is a whole other animal than just having your ratings go up. Right. But I think that one of his bets is, I mean, if if you kind of think for a moment that Sports Center isn't what it used to be and unique content and particularly the opinion content that he's really focusing on, then you might have somebody come into the bar and say, Hey, wait a second, you know, I want to see those two guys yelling at each other. Yelling, you yeah. know, so you know, take that off. I mean, that's probably one of the judo moves that he's counting on. And at least it's proprietary, right? You can't find it someplace else. The subs is a is a huge deal though, because and I remember when I was there when they used to talk to me about this stuff, this was like 2013. Like they, they knew the subs were on the radar in the 2013. Like they could see the writing on the wall and they were hoping what they were hoping. They thought it was going to level off. They didn't think it was going to plummet because that was right when they were talking about, all right, if we do this NBA deal, what are our subs going to look like five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, they didn't see this happening. And what they didn't see was, was the cord cutters and, they had no idea that they were going to lose 10% of their subs over the course of three years. And I think there's, I think people have overreacted to this and underreacted because the overreaction is like, Oh, their business is going to like ESPN's going to be fine. They're not going away, but there's no way to get these people back. And with the way these ESPN cable deals work, they can't stream ESPN. Like even this deal, you, I'm sure you read about the big deal this week with, uh, with um, where they bought part of BAM yeah. and they're going to re release digital ESPN, but ESPN can't be on digital ESPN. Right. So they're re obviously their plan is to release. It's going to have a bunch of other channels they create. And then eventually someday when these deals are up, maybe that's when ESPN goes on this thing. So they're laying the groundwork, which is smart, but you know, look, but in the meantime, they're going to lose a lot of money. Dollars? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's it's unbelievable. $80 a year for like, my mom, who never watches ESPN ever. That and was the whole thing with John baggage. McCain and a la carte. Yeah. And, you know, for years, that was their biggest concern, a la carte, and they beat that out. And now, you know, I, you, you see people graduating from college, they go out and buy Apple TV. That's it. Yeah, now, most of the young people, especially some people who have worked for The Ringer, they, they stream everything. They do the Slink TV or Skinny Bundle or whatever. Yeah, and, or just even Apple TV. I mean, they just there's no need. At the same time, like I don't think people know how to measure ratings, rewatchability, all that stuff, and especially like I've never trusted the ESPN ratings because how do you how do you judge fifty people in a bar on one TV? I know they have like weird kooky methods to judge it, but I I still don't think it's an accurate. Like they say, twenty million people watch the Game Seven of the NBA Finals, or what was it, twenty five million? Was it 25, really? I don't know. Whatever it was, yeah. it's got to be higher than whatever the number was. Uh, you listen, have so many people watching it together. How do you measure that? And, and we're, uh, listen, I, I think we're, we're straddling errors because we still don't know, really know how to talk about ratings. I mean, yeah. I see people tweeting about last night's you know, prime time ratings on NBC during the Olympics. It's like, are, are you kidding? I mean, it's, you got to be like the streaming numbers and, and all the various channels and all the, I mean, th th that's, I mean, NBC is going to make a fortune off these Olympics. These numbers are huge. Yeah. They're, they're touching, you know, more than half of the world, uh, you know, half of the country. Uh, I mean, more than that, three quarters. I mean, they, the penetration is unbelievable. It's just that sometimes we have this anachronistic way to like talk about it. I don't think there's any way to measure it. And I know, you know, especially like the, the seven day cum right, is right, a big right. thing. And how do you measure on demand? How do you measure the streaming service, all that stuff? But all I know is like, if I go to a restaurant and I ask, I could pick 50 people and be like, what do you think of Simone Biles? I'm going to say 35 people know who I'm talking about and watched at least one part of her gymnastics, you know? So maybe it's not a 70 share like it was during the days of Bruce Jenner in 1976, but it's well, if you the combine it with there. if you combine it with all the other outlets and distribution paths, I mean it's it's blows you away. I mean last night, who else? I mean with Phelps and some. I mean Phelps like, is a godsend. I, I mean, mean Phelps is at that Tiger level now where he's just he, if you would just want to see him win more. Now I, it's I feel like, like, like you know freak. one day, and I hope it's a hundred years from now when. Uh, for Michael Phelps, but like, remember when Secretariat died and they yeah. did the autopsy on Secretariat? Did you ever hear when about he had this? The William Knack said how he had the giant heart. No, like his heart was like literally physically twice the size of any <laughs> other heart. A freak. Like yeah. it's just like, oh my god! And I, I just feel like, you know, Phelps is is like Secretariat. I mean, like last night he was so far ahead of you know the rest of the pack. I, I, it's I like just, that analogy. That's a good you one. You know, you just 
I mean, you're never going to see it again. I mean, so what's your, what's your next book? I don't know. You don't know? Well, you've done three, you've done three iconic franchises. I, I might be um, updating a certain previous book. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Really? Uh, you know, look, there's just, sorry, but there's just too much drama that's happened since then. Oh, my God. Well, you, I just, just gave you my interview. Just I just talked. Oh, talk, yeah, you that's can use, enough. Forget you can use about the podcast it. Stuff. I'm going to give you sodium pentothal, put you horizontal, <laughs> and get the real story. Um, what, what real story? No, I mean, a lot of people have mentioned it to me. I, there's a kind of a part of me. I don't like going backwards, but I don't think it would go backwards. Just think of all the things that have happened to ESPN since those guys came out. Um, not only in terms of the stuff we've been talking about, about the business changing and everything else, but it's been a fascinating been, decade. There's more out there. Oh, well, there you go. So that sounds book worthy. <laughs> that sounds real book worthy. Now you really stepped in it. You know what sucks is being written about when you're a writer. Yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird experience. Writers are meant to write about other people. They're not meant to be part of the whole, you know, I know, but in a part of a kind story. of way, you got so big that it couldn't be helped. Well, it wasn't a big, it was the suspension thing was the one that's what changed it. Like when I was on the fucking view. It was like, what the, like the, it's impossible. The, right. The girls on the view are talking about me. I'm like a sports writer. Well, also I think it was, look, it was a one, two punch. It was the suspension, but then it was the New York times, uh, you know, story. I, I mean, I think that look in the history of ESPN, that is a, that, that's, that's, that's a quite an unusual event. So you had two, really big matzo balls that just landed you know uh, attached to your name yeah well football is a very important sport to them right and you discovered that when i don't know probably september 2014 no get out of here i mean that was the thing that was always interesting to me which was i mean like you're a bright guy and you know you know the sports world and you knew espn yeah. so it was like you were going to the most dangerous playground and you were picking on like the i mean like you could have, you could have gone to any other area, any other and, area in recess, and and done. <laughs> could have gone to the handball court. Yeah, you know, but I'm just saying though. I mean, you're not naive. I mean, you knew when you start going down that path with the NFL and with Roger, you you kind of understand what kind of high wire act you're doing, right? Yeah, I would. Is it the high wire act? I like that. With no net. I will say that the, the one in May was, I mean, that was innocuous. So, it's just flat out innocuous. Like if you heard, if you heard the interview, it was, I do, but, you know, I think, I think what happens sometimes when people are really busy is they get forwarded stories that people write and they don't have time to listen to them. And they're like, oh, it's kind of curious though, in August of 2016, that you're kind of putting innocuous and the NFL in the same sentence. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, one might take issue with that. Which Inoc is, what do you mean innocuous? I, well, there's nothing when it comes to the NFL. Um, aren't you living proof that, you know, innocuous may not be the correct word. True. I think that's fair, but you know, it was what it was. It, it was, it was heading toward a certain place anyway. I think by that point. Right. I actually think, you know, I've been asked, to, I, I I don't think that the outcome would have been different, but the pathway and the route to it would have been and could have been and should have been probably, yeah. you know, different. That's all. I think everybody turned out fine. Oh, yeah. No, no it's not. It's, it's, it's not about that. Wouldn't I mean, you say I exceeded the over under, though? I mean, I thought I was going to get fired after your book came out. 2009. Well, if some of the or other stuff had stayed. 2011. If some of the other stuff had stayed. <laughs> Um, you know, you know, that was one of my highlights at Grantland was your book came out and Walsh got it and Walsh happened to be there because they had liquidated all of EOE. So he was in Joan Lynch's old office, <laughs> just trapped in there with your book. And we all snuck over cause the door was closed. We were just listening to him read it and it would just be dead silence. And then you'd hear like, Oh, come on. And there would just be seven more minutes of dead silence. And then it'd be like that Walsh laugh, like, <laughs> <laughs> and then like three more minutes and we just could hear it through the walls and he i think he read your entire book in like five hours yeah is that one, possible one sitting yeah it's like a 700 page book yeah he was well, just he's... in there he was trapped in there holding the book an inch from his face and just devoured the book and had real-time reactions to it and I did should, he, uh, we didn't have facebook live back then it would have been fantastic did he come out uh, immediately and ask you to write the letters of apology <laughs> no but you know what it was 
there was so many other worse things in there that I, I kind of skated underneath it for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. For a couple of weeks. Right. I actually, I really like Mike Tarico and now I feel bad. I wish I, I, I wish I'd, that's the one. That's the one. I don't feel bad about anything else I said, but I do like Mike Tarico. I just think him and Tony were a bad match. Right. I think that's, I think that's I wish true. I'd been more diplomatic to Mike Tarico. Well, but I, I think in fairness to you, I mean, look, I Tony was, got a rod. I love Tony. Yeah, Tony you got a rod, Tony, Dale. I love Tony. Tony's my family. And, yep. And that's uh, it. I think everybody who saw that totally, totally got that. I mean. I do think the art of selling somebody on TV. Underappreciated. I mean. It's the most underrated thing about TV. It is and so. I've had it all kinds of ways. And it's like, it's pro wrestling. You're doing a move. You know, I'm doing my pile driver. You better sell it like you hurt your neck on my pile driver. And that's just how TV has to go. And Kornheiser is the best at that. I would have loved to have done. Remember in VH1, I guess, the pop up, you know, when like, you know, what they had the little bubbles that come up with people really thinking that would have been great for you when you were at ESPN on the NBA show. Like to the pop ups. You know, pop up video, like where you actually talk, you, you write about what people are really thinking at that moment. And it's, but the way they structure those shows, maybe they'll change it at some point, but it's, it's just your turn, your turn, your turn, my turn, which, you know, I, I, when I joined the show, that was not what it was supposed to be. I don't think the, the, when you're doing TV like that, and I think first take is a good example, right? I don't know if I would like doing first take because first take is basically... I do a 90 to three minute monologue and then you react to my monologue and you come back with a three minute monologue and we exchange monologues. Right. And there's an art to it. I thought Max was a really smart move for them. I really like Max and Max is actually good in that format. Other people wouldn't be. Stephen A is fantastic in it. Like Stephen A can talk for eight straight minutes. I don't know anyone who can do that. But it's also eight straight minutes like in one or two end zones, he doesn't say anything between the 40 yard lines. I mean, that's the other thing about that show, which is like, you can't like really talk about vanilla and chocolate and you know how they're great flavors. You got to like go extreme and you got to do that for several minutes at a time. People I mean, that's like that tough. though. No, that's what I'm saying. But that's, that's what makes that really tough. Right. So whereas PTI is, you have to be able to, you have to, you, you're kind of doing these little mini, you read the teleprompter, you throw it to the other guy, that guy, now you have 90 seconds and it can go one of two ways at that point. The guy you throw it to can either just talk for a minute straight and you're screwed. And when it comes back to you, you have 25 seconds and you get the next thing, or they can go short 20, 25. And now we're going back and forth. And the people that work on that show, and this is why Wobon and Tony are so great is whoever's up, they'll go. 25 maybe 30 back the ball starts moving back and forth and that's how tv is supposed to work when you can you're we doing just it. say like seriously i know i tried to say it in the book but eric ride home he's very good at that well he's very good at he, making sure the ball moves uh, he is he is a, a really really smart creative person who has you know developed things that are um that now you know live at channels way beyond even ESPN. I mean, he's he's a pretty smart architect. That's a fun what if for your next book, which I'm not going to participate in. Mm -hmm. um, Good to hear. The, uh, the <laughs> uh, if Kornheiser's wife had okayed the LA move, how is the course of ESPN different? Yeah. It was, I think, 2011. And all of... PTI, all of Ride Home, everything Ride Home was doing was going to move to LA and Ride Home was going to take over the basketball show. This, this was yeah. talked about, discussed. Yep. And they were going to do PTI from LA. And Kornheiser was going to live like across the street from Jerry's Deli. He was all excited about it. He had like his spot picked out. He was going to walk there. And and uh, and then Wilbon obviously would have loved it. Like he loves the West Coast. And everything was going to move. And then they would have done the NBA show, I think, with a whole hodgepodge of you know, uh, magic and Wilbon, Kornheiser, me, whoever else. And it just would have been a rotating thing. And then Kornheiser's wife didn't want to leave. She liked, she's been on the East coast, whatever. But LA would have been less of, I mean, there were people in Bristol who viewed 
your operation in LA, like Three Mile Island, and they didn't want to, you know, have anything to do with it. And it was a very combative, antagonistic place. I think that with Ride Home there, I mean, he's kind of like Switzerland. That hurts my feelings, the combative, antagonistic. You, you, I mean. No, I'm not saying that you feel that way, but it's, it's just weird. You didn't weird. sense that? Well, we'd never really dealt with them. I mean, the whole point of it, we were like, we were buried yeah. over in our little corner doing our thing. Right. But don't you think that's part of the explanation of that? Yeah. I, but I, mean, I, don't know, I, I think anti, I don't think we were antagonistic to them. No, no, no. The I was talking about that, them. I said there yeah. were people in Bristol who were antagonistic about LA and your operation. They were, yeah. some of them were, pe were jealous I totally get and it. envious. And also you guys weren't playing by some of the rules that they had to play by in, uh, you know, in Bristol. And so there was a whole thing about well, the rules are basically we got to drop a couple f bombs and use footnotes but also i mean we didn't they felt like uh you know there was uh, there wasn't a principle out there there wasn't i mean you know, they had layers of management on, on yeah. them all the time and you know you're punching the clock and you're you you know and they felt like you know you guys had some more freedom and i think there was a lot of uh you know i mean surely you know this there was a lot of jealousy about the la operation and i think that that would have been somewhat so, so you're saying the ride home part would have made that yeah i think it would have helped i think it would have helped a we lot potentially could add all the ride home shows grant win and basically 30 for 30 maybe all in the all in la and i don't know what that would have meant but you know it is what it is it's pretty interesting what if though yeah no plus, Cor a, plus cornizer would have spent like five million dollars at jerry's deli that's the other outcome a lot right. of a lot of scrambled eggs no i mean like there's that. lots of uh we were just doing that about politics what if tipper gore had allowed al gore to let bill clinton give a couple speeches for him in 2000 what if mike ovitz had taken the universal job right what if mike ovitz did you do a good job or a bad job i think it's a fundamentally different company i think he's like he's he's much more into distribution channels and technology and all sorts of things. I mean, you could have seen, um, I, I don't think he would have had the era of, uh, talent, um, you know, the, like universal being known as a, as a great place to hang out, uh, like, you know, Ron is engineered, but at the same time, it may have been a, a more diverse place. I don't think he would have ever stayed as long as Ron. There's no way. There's no way. I mean, he's too, I, I think it seemed like he lost his fastball a little bit. You know, the best one ever was Bodenheimer. Bodenheimer left incredible exit. No, no. Like Has serious, there ever been a better exit in the history of media? In, in, no, in the history of Western civilization. The best. The guy who, like, literally, it's the red carpet on the ESPYs and the most unassuming guy with tassel loafers with the lowest profile in the world turns out to be the shark. He's the smartest guy in the world. <laughs> He's he, like, I'm out. People are like, where are you going? We're doing great. It's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to spend more time with my yacht. I'm totally fine. I'm, yeah, I'm He's good. like, I bought a boat. I'm yeah. Good. He's like 51 years old in perfect health. And, uh, I mean, the most unbelievable timing. It was almost like how dogs can hear noises when other people can't and dogs ears go up and you're like, what's the matter? What do you like? Bodenheimer's ears went up and he's like, I'm out. I had a great run. I'll see you guys later. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Some weird shit's about to happen. I'm done. <laughs> and by the way, the chairman title, John Skipper, don't worry about that. Cause I, I you yeah. know, it's fine. I don't mind it as a transition thing, but I'm, I'm not going to be really, you know, I'll be here when you need me. What but, a great guy. Know, don't I mean, worry about it. You, did you ever find one bad person is, or one person say anything bad about Bodenheimer when no. you did your book? Did no. one person say anything about him? No, he's just, you know, I mean, he is, he is the most decent, hardworking guy. I think that there are people who, you know, particularly coming after Steve Bornstein, who's a real alpha male. Yeah. I mean, they weren't used to like the fact that he was so soft spoken and he really talked about the culture and he really, but it's very hard to find people who will slam Bodenheimer, especially now because the guy was like literally the Nostradamus of the sports world. Jim Miller, powerhouse, uh, available everywhere. September 7th, were you interviewing Ovitz and Ron Meyer? The Director's Guild in Beverly Hills. Oh, wow. Day before football season starts. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Sonos, the smart speaker system that streams all of your favorite music to any room or every room in just one simple app that brings together all your favorite music services and you can control everything. Whatever room in the house you want, they will play music in there. It can be one song. It can be a bunch of songs. Add your existing music services or discover something new. Try Sonos. Don't forget to check out TheRinger.com. Don't forget about our other seven podcast feeds 
on the Ringer Podcast Network. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash ringer, where we just put up House Eat 6. Danny Chow soundly defeating Joe House. What a sad day for Joe House fans. Wow. And don't forget about my HBO show, Any Given Wednesday. We wrap the first eight episodes. We are off for a couple weeks, coming back on September 7th. But you can check out all the old ones on HBO On Demand, HBO Now, and HBO Go. Uh, not only all the episodes, but all the bonus clips we've done. And we actually have some bonus content coming out the next two weeks while we're off. That's it. Enjoy the weekend. Go America.